heating up and there's more to be done for God, then you ought to be a part of what God is doing in his church. Can you say amen? Now is not the time to get distracted, to become complacent, or to fall into the lap of mediocrity. Now is the time to burden your heart with a new flame of zeal until it presses upon you the very caricature of Jesus himself. Until you get so zealous for his house and his cause and the lost and dying around you that you cannot live in ease, but you are troubled in your own life to tell somebody else about Jesus. Is there anybody here that feels the perplexing weight of sin weigh you to the point that it troubles you and wakens you and says, you must tell somebody about Jesus? All right. Well, how many of you are aware of what's going on in the world today? Last night, in your evening time, in the middle of the night for Israel, she was attacked by the enemies that had been prophesied against her from the pages of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. Are you with me? If you are unaware of that fact, I know that I've talked to some this morning and they were unaware of the news of that. It's the first time in Israel's national history that Persia has outrightly attacked her. And last night they launched over 300 drones, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles at Israel. And um, the night sky was filled with the terror of Israel's enemies. We thank the Lord that he kept his hand upon her and that Iran, Persia, in your Bible, with the configurations of Russia, which is Magog in your Bible, which you will find in Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. If you haven't recognized this or not, let me help you. While you were attending your affairs at midnight, God was pulling back the blood-soaked curtains of prophecy so that you could look through his pages into the valley of Jehoshaphat and see what is happening around the world. And if you have any awareness at all of Scripture, then in your spirit you must leap up on your feet and recognize now is the time that I run into Luke the 21st chapter. If you know about Ezekiel 38, you ought to have swift feet to run to Luke 21. Because Luke 21 and 28 tell you that you must be doing three things. Looking up, for your redemption draws nigh. Praying for peace, the God of Israel, to rule over Jerusalem. And making everyone around you aware that Jesus is coming back soon. So I wonder if there are anybody in this room right now that feels a burning, passionate call to stand up and make some noise for the God of Israel. Get up on your feet and shout unto the God of Israel. Right now, right now, right now, I'm gonna get up and make some noise for the God who cannot be defeated. I want to make some noise so that the enemies of Israel know that we stand in grace knowing the time that we live in. Amen? How many of you are aware of the times that we live in? Somebody shout, my redemption is drawing nigh. God preserve me to live in this hour. I have a front row seat into apocalyptic prophecy. And I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. That should, that should put a, a deep zeal in our life to where we want to stand up and tell everybody Jesus is coming. Get your house in order. Make your way to the house of God. Now is not the time to be uh, lying at ease in the couches of Laodicea. Now is the time to awaken and shout with a voice of triumph. 
Can you say amen? Now is not the time to be drunk on the wine and the wonder of this world. But it's time to wake up and say, Lord, have your way with me. I want my children saved. I want my grandchildren saved. I want my families protected. I want the people that I oversee to be blessed and favored and quarantined in your safety. Can you say amen? And so the world is on the precipice of a world war this morning. And the entire world has her eyes on the Middle East. And I say, this is the, the time for the last day church to rise up and be the last day church. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Before we get into the word this morning, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who is here and tell you how much we love you and we appreciate you and all of the things that God is doing throughout our city and our state and our nation, we give the Lord praise for. And I am uh, certainly overwhelmed with the goodness of God and the benevolence of his people in the mission of the Church of Champions. And uh, I recognize that he has blessed us to have a worldwide influence even in those uh, seasons when we might have seen decrease here. But I want you to help me prophesy to every single seat that you see empty and say you are being filled now in Jesus' name. The hungry are running here now in Jesus' name. There'll be a, there'll be a season in a few days. There'll be times when you'll see people lined up at church house doors trying to get in. And it won't be one time a week. It's going to be four and five times a day trying to get into the presence of God and pray and cry out to God. The reason America is so soft is because we've had it so easy. What would happen if we had our cities bombarded and the enemy terrorizing our night skies with missile after missile? I believe our behavior would be just a little bit different. And I think our disposition would just change a bit so that we would reflect a desperation for God's protection like we have never, ever exercised before. Now, I don't know about you, but I want God and his holy protection over my life, over our city, and over our people. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. Uh, before we get into the word this morning, I have an apology to make. I want to uh, publicly apologize to each of you who are so faithful with helping us share the Word of God throughout the week. We have a special podcast on Tuesday evenings, and it has been very, very exciting to see how that podcast is growing and the influence that is having around the country and around the world. Many, many people are telling us how they're watching it uh, all over the world. We've had people in Switzerland reach out to us. We've had people in Europe reach out to us. And uh, so if you don't know... I would encourage you to tune in this Tuesday night. Last Tuesday, we had a cataclysmic, calamitous failure of which I was completely unaware until about the 15-minute mark. I was just having the best time, Brother Alvin, talking, and God was moving, and there was such an anointing. And I'm telling you, I was just flowing with it finally, Rocky looks up and goes, you haven't been saying a thing. <laughs> so many of you were sending me messages. God bless each one of you, Johnny, and several others sent me messages. Pastor, we can't hear a word you're saying. But I didn't have my phone. <laughs> Did you know that the enemy hates the word? And he specifically hates a revelation preacher. Now, I don't talk like this very often, but I, I need you to, those of you that are part of this church and this family, I need you to ride with me for just a moment. Um, he hates seers because they can reveal his next moves. So um, he touched some of our equipment, some of our software failed, some of our uh, hard mechanical systems pieces of equipment failed and um, we've had people looking at that and it's going to cost um, a total to get the right pieces of equipment that we need 
to uh, do the broadcast like we want to do it, it's a total of about $3,900. The piece of equipment that we need tomorrow is $1,400. I'm just talking to myself, I guess. I don't know where my wife is. It costs a lot of money for those little bitty black boxes. And I don't know why it costs that much. I would complain just like you're complaining right now, but nobody's listening. <laughs> and so uh, we need uh, to just make you aware of that fact. If you would like to help us, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to put a guilt trip on you. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm going to tell you about the need and then ask the Lord to move upon you. If you would like to invest in that and help us with that, that would be such a huge blessing, and it would mean so much to the kingdom of God. I would ask you to also pray over this campus. It seems that much of uh, my historical work that was put in boxes and kept here in the safekeeping of this campus has been stolen. So much of my 30 years of writing uh, it seems has been carried off by the bandits of the night who would like to um, use that for their own purposes. And the Lord knows how to rectify that. Amen? So just pray a covering over this campus. Would you do that? That the Lord would smite the bandits and give them gnarly fingers that do not work. No, they need to repent and need to come to salvation. And God needs to bless them. And then if they want something, I'll give it to them. They don't have to steal it. Amen? Is that good? Amen. All right. I love you and I thank God for you. If you would like to, I'm just going to pray. Um, we continue to need uh, God to move for us with our mortgage. Uh, the times that we live in, they've escalated our mortgage again. The insurance companies no longer want to carry insurance on commercial properties in Texas because now we've entered into a new phase of atmospheric changes that uh, might open us up to more hurricanes. And so all kinds of insurance companies are leaving South Texas. And it just seems like the peril uh, of the enemy is directed toward the children of God. So I wonder if you would stand one more time to your feet with me. And I want to take a special season of prayer. And I just want to present this need to the Lord. He knows about our Tuesday night broadcast. He knows about our podcast. He knows about all of the things that we're trying to get to the world. He knows about the leadership that is depending upon us to speak into their worlds and their lives. Did you know on Tuesday night there are entire churches that are gathering and watching us on their screens? four and five hundred people in one location in America that I know of. There are hundreds of locations in Africa and in Europe that are watching us just talk about the goodness of God and the word that's happening and what God's doing. So you never know how the enemy has been orchestrating his attack against you until you realize the call of God on your life and what he wants to do with you. Amen? The enemy never attacks you where you are. He attacks you where you're going. So if you would pray with me like right now, and if you want to make an investment, if you want to give to that, there will be a season right after we're praying. If you want to get online and give to that, you can do that. If you want to give a special offering, you can do that. But I'm just going to ask you to pray with me for the Lord to meet this need. Would you do that? Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for every work that you're doing in our life. We thank you for the opportunities that you've given us to be a light around the world. We thank you, Lord, that you've invested us into the Toro kingdom and you're providing them answers and you're providing them curriculum through this church. The enemy has tried to steal that. But I know, God, that you're going to replenish us and you're going to equip us and you're going to make us what you want us to be. 
And you're going to satisfy the longings in our heart to meet every need according to your word. We thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for those who will invest, Lord, another offering into spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you, oh God, to defend us against the rising tides of assaults on the commerce of this church. In Jesus' name we pray. You, Lord, said that if we would give, the bounty and treasure of your church would never fail. And we thank you for meeting that need right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you for providing us with the coverages that we need, Lord. Without the escal escalation of rates, you're able to provide that thing for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. I love you. I thank God for you. Let's, let's all praise the Lord for Brother Alvin. Don't you love him? Amen. If he, if he uh, starts playing that Hammond organ, uh, I might preach, you know. I don't have to, you just have to watch out. Uh, oh, now, come on. Come on. Going to make me do it. Somebody said, won't he do it? I think they were talking about the Lord, but I'm talking about Brother Alvin. Mm, my God in heaven. Well, well, well. I love you. I thank God for you. And we're going to have fun this morning. I'm always going to have fun when I'm in the presence of God because he saved me and delivered me. Amen. He saved me. He preserved me. He's kept me. And there's so many of us that have that testimony of how God's goodness has prevailed over our lives, even at times when we were harming ourselves or others were attempting to harm us or when injustices would rise upon the landscape of our life, God's goodness preserved us and kept us. It doesn't mean he insulated us and nothing happened. We might have walked through some things, but we have this testimony that when we got out on the other side, the goodness of the Lord was seen in the land of the living. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. I love you and I thank God for you. Now, if you have your Bibles, which is an old concept, If you have your Bibles, uh, you'll want to note two texts this morning in which we're going to orbit and find the universe of thought that God's laid upon my heart. And I've shifted just a little bit because of what's happened in the last 16 hours in Israel uh, and in the Middle East. But I want God's blessing and help as we move through uh, this text. If you have your Bibles, you'll want to turn in the New Testament to Philippians, the third chapter, and you'll want to orient yourself to the writings of Paul to the church in Philippi. It is there that you see uh, Paul writing to this church, and he's um, lauding them with the praises and the um, expectations of praise for them. And he says specifically, every time that you come into my memory, I give God praise for you. I'm overwhelmed with praise by God, for God, and through God for you. Would you love somebody else to praise God every time they thought of you? This is the church at Philippi, and uh, this, is, that is, this is what's happening uh, in the orientation of this church. Now, if you don't know where Philippi is, it was in northern Greece, and it was a Grecian church, and it was filled with uh, those expatriates of Jerusalem and others, uh, Gentiles, that were gathered there, and they were worshiping Jesus as Messiah, and they became the New Testament church, the ecclesia of uh, the church that was born on Pentecost morn in Jerusalem. And they're, they're living for God. They're extravagant in their giving. They're sacrificing in their praise. And God is using them magnanimously to affect the whole of his kingdom. And then when you leap from Philippians, the third chapter, and specifically reach back to Leviticus, the 12th chapter, and the sixth verse, I want, to, uh, I want to make that corollary for you this morning and show you exactly where we're living today. Somebody say this with me. God's word, God's word. is right on time. I heard someone this week say that God's word is an antiquated word and why would I want to live my life in accordance with something that was written millennia ago and has no relationship to me? 
They were specifically talking about their morality. They were talking about uh, their release from a Judeo-Christian morality and they no longer live uh, under the uh, canopy of morality that we call norm. They're living their life in the terms and in the context of what they choose to believe and they think that the scripture has no relation to them. I've come to tell you this morning that the scripture not only has relationship to us, but it informs us where we are and what's coming. So in that, I want to speak to you and continue the thought that we began last week when I began to talk to you about the heavens declare the glory of God and they reveal to us what in hell is going on. The word of God informs us what the enemy of people, the people of God, what the enemy is planning to do. Are you aware of that? The Bible will tell you what your enemy is attempting to do and how he is raising up an army and arsenaling them against you. So he informs you the tactics of, his, uh, of the enemy. Those are called the mysterions of God. I don't have time for that this morning. But Jesus, when he was speaking about this very thing, he reaches back to a Napoleonic law and he, and he conscripts from Alexander's vocabulary the word mysterion. And he says that I'm going to give my people the mysteries of my kingdom. And I'm going to equip them to understand what they must do to overwhelm the enemy of their time. And that's what we need this morning. Somebody shake yourself and say, I'm not going to permit myself to live in self-pity another day. Well, I'm going to have to break this down. <laughs> Some of us want to squander our lives by looking in a rearview mirror and thinking about all of the things that happened to us that should not have happened. And we want to blame all of our problems on what happened in the past and continue to focus on the things that are behind us. But Paul said, I don't look at the things behind me. I don't consider the things behind me. I am looking forward to press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You cannot accomplish anything looking in the rearview mirror. In fact, the Bible says specifically, a man that looks back is not worthy. You cannot accomplish anything for God looking back. The only time we would want to look back is to learn from our past. History will inform us of our future if we'll learn from it. But our disposition is not backward. Our disposition is forward. Somebody say forward. So if I'm going to get into uh, this, this nouveau movement of living in culture, I should only get into that movement of being a part of culture from an eschatological viewpoint. I've got to come into culture with an eye set on the future. I've got to recognize what God called me to so that I can live from his word. Can I get a witness? Somebody say, the significance... That's weak. You ought to type that in the chat box. <laughs> the significance of Christian eschatology is that it precedes me loudly. It speaks to me boldly. It informs me thoughtfully. It helps me to write adaptly. And it proclaims forcefully for me the dangers that lurk in the briny waters of an anti-God culture. Everything in the Word of God speaks very loudly proclaiming boldly what we must guard against. Is that negative? No, that's informative. That's what wisdom is called. If you ever chase down in the book of Proverbs the word of God and, it's, and it informs you of the seven pillars of wisdom, you ought to recognize what we need to be aware of. And you can only do that if you're open-minded enough to hear the word of God inform you about your future. 
and believers in Jesus Christ do not move through an anti-God culture and do not traffic in a civilization of people that have been marooned and flailing for truth and they don't know where they're turning to and they don't know what they're doing and they don't know what they're serving. They do know they don't believe in God, but they believe in every other God. And if we're going to traffic among that people, we're going to do it because we have an eschatological viewpoint. In other words, we've got a God from our future. We're not going into this thing living and occupying one day at a time. We're seers who see the future. And we peer into places that others do not perceive. You ought to praise God if you have a preacher in your life that can perceive the future. I'm going to try it one more time because I never do talk like this, but I'm going to talk about it now. If all you got is a preacher that stands up and says, I feel like God's about to do something, but he can't tell you what God's about to do, you better send him back to the prayer room because we need apostolic preachers. That means we need people that are born out of the book of Acts that have the apostles' doctrines red hot on their lips that can tell you exactly what God is doing in the earth. I don't want God to be talking to me about getting a new Cadillac when all hell's breaking loose and 300 missiles are falling in Israel. I'm not concerned about a Cadillac. I need God to save my family. Can I get a witness? Me driving a new Cadillac my God, that's like in the 90s. That's 90s theology. I feel like God's going to bless you with $1,000. Come on, man, give me a break. What we need today can't be purchased with a $1,000 bill. We need God to rivet himself to us, stitch himself so close to us that no thing can hurt us. And you don't get that unless you're praying and fasting. It doesn't come easy and it doesn't come for free. It takes you disciplining yourself to get in his upper room and say, I'm not leaving until you endue me with power from on high. Come on here. Some, you know, <laughs> this, this, this newfangled Christianity uh, comes with a confession but no repentance. So we confess that we know him, but we've never died to self to get him. And so what happens is it makes, uh, it makes a Christianity, a pseudo-Christianity, because there's no death in it. Lest the seed fall into the ground and Unless we be buried in Christ, we cannot be raised in him. And so what we have is we've got this, we've got this thing coming on earth. This, this engine of prophecy is rolling across like a mighty tempest. It's rolling across earth right now. And God is raising up seers who can peer into places others do not perceive. And they can acknowledge what God is doing when others do not know. And if they're not promoted, if they're not prayed for, if they're not surrounded with care and prayed for and begging God to protect them, they'll become a voice from a distance. And their voice will be very, very dimmed in light of the sounds of culture and all its calamity. If you don't know what a real preacher sounds like, you better find out. You don't need a guy in your life telling you what you want to hear. You better pray for a guy in your life or a gal in your life that can tell you what God said. I know this is not popular. I understand that. Put your popularity contest back under the seat. The vote is not now. Right? We're not running a popularity contest. I've come this morning to inform you of something that will make you shout tomorrow. 
It won't make you shout right now, but it will make you run tomorrow. You'll be up here with James going, woo <laughs> Can I get a witness? Yes. All right, somebody say, a seer, a, seer. a God-appointed seer, right. peers into places Peers. others do not perceive. So you don't listen to their voices that rile against a seer because they never understand him. He's always misunderstood. I don't know why he does what he does. That's exactly what they said about Jeremiah. Especially when he disrobes. That's what they say about the prophets, especially in those times when they're sawing their heads off. And it's not the people that are alien and pagan to the cause of God. It's the people that claim to know God and are called by him. It's the religious folk that persecute the prophetic every time. So I'm trying to warn you this morning, you better get a place in your life where it is sanctimonious, it is a sanctuary, and it is a place of safety for the voice of prophecy. You better build a citadel around the words of prophecy and you better hold them and collect them and you better make them tender to your life and you, and you must measure them and say, Lord, protect my ears to hear so that I can hear what you are saying when others are calamitous. If you listen to the news last night, I, I, I was fixated with, this dystopian language of newscasters who have no clue of Scripture. And they're talking about all of their opinions in light of their secular education. And none of them have answers, and all of them are confounded. And I was raising my hand. I was in my chair, <laughs> raising my hand. I got it. Just call me. Here's my number. Talk to me. I'm here. It's a free call. All you have to do is know a little bit of scripture. And there's no confrontation with misunderstanding. It's before us. But no one wants to hear that we're living there. All of us, our flesh, longs to hear, I've still got time to retire and buy a bass boat. Oh, I just touched a God right there. Let me see Lake Houston. Uh, Conroe. Here, let me try it one more time. We all want to hear, we have time to measure our enjoyment and do some things we've longed to do. I'm not telling you I know the time, but I am telling you that we're living in the season. And we are foolhardy if we go into this season longing and leveraging our life to get one more thrill without any attempt to live in the hour and live in the moment and be aware of God's presence. We can do both. We occupy till he comes, but we make our faces like flint and looking toward the eastern sky and saying, Lord, come quickly and come quickly on your time. Come so that you preserve your people. Awaken in me a hot, red hot, lively stone of revival. I refuse to be marooned in a civilization that is quarantined in their ease and dies in their temples of flesh. Somebody here? So, if we're going to do that, we have to change the way we think about the prophetic, uh, our prophetic view of life. Everybody say prophetic view. My prophetic view of life informs my eternal destination. My prophetic view of life informs my eternal destination. And I'm going to speak from a place that most people do not, who do not have a prophetic point of view, which is eschatology, if they don't have that, they're going to misunderstand that. They're going to call you things like religiously fanatic. Oh, they're just fanatics. They're fanatics for Jesus. You don't remember this, but back in the 60s, they had the Jesus culture. And it was hippies who were getting saved 
and still being hippies. They just changed altars. They still wore their colorful bell bottoms. They said things like, peace, man. <laughs> Jesus is cool, man. Y'all don't remember that, but that's part of American history. What's up, man? What are you doing? Oh, man, we're going to the bus, and we're just hanging out, playing some music, man. You remember that? The bell bottoms, they're back, by the way. Uh, this, this, this culture takes what they think God is doing, they conform it and wrap it into their own imaginations, and they try to pretend that that's the new movement of God. If you have a proper eschatology, you don't import what God is, what you think God is saying into your life, and you allow your life to make the caricature of the word form into your opinion. You step into that word and become what God is doing. Did you just get that? We don't pray for God to change and reflect his word so that it fits within our paradigm. We say, God, we're walking with you, so quicken us. Philip, what are you doing? I'm being transported to a revival. And so I'm speaking to you from a different place this morning that you're going to have to go back and listen to this very carefully and make certain that you get exactly what I'm saying. If you're going to live for the future, you've got to live from the future. You cannot have your future and your present informed by people who have no clue about the scripture. And if they think that God is confined to an old rugged cross and all that there is to talk about is an empty cross, then you better get up and say, Lord, help me, Jesus, to understand what the book of Revelation, what the book of Ezekiel, what Jeremiah, what Isaiah are screaming to me in 2024. 2,500 years before Jesus Christ came, there were prophets that were speaking things that they did not understand. John on Patmos was writing about things that are happening right now that he did not know how to describe. He saw them and he did not know what they were and he tried to describe them and he said they're going to look like locusts but they're going to spit fire, but they won't eat any green herb, but they're going to come after the destruction of men. Does that not sound like a drone from... Does that not sound like an Apache helicopter? He didn't know how to say Apache helicopter. He didn't know what that mechanized thing was, but he was trying to conform it in a language, the only language he knew how to describe. But he tells us exactly what is going to happen. And the church needs to wake up and get a vibrancy in its sound. We need to wake up and say, this might be the last time we assemble. So I'm going to worship God like it's the last time I have. Yeah, but what if he doesn't come for 30 years? Then I'm going to live every day like it's the last day and I'm going to plan on living for 30 years. I'm not going to let my contemplations of God's word fail. I won't let my enthusiasm for God quarantine me into a place of Laodicea. I'm going to stir up the gift of God that is in me. I'm going to be passionate about what God's doing through me. I'm going to shout with a voice of triumph. Somebody shout yes. yes. You got to get stirred up in this thing. And you can't wait for somebody else to tickle your ear. You can't wait for the atmosphere to get just right. Well, I'm waiting on a specific word. Whoever told you that? That's, that's where... Uh, the gift of suspicion works from the dark clouds of destruction and is belched out of hell. Manipulation works from the gates of hell. And if you don't know what manipulation looks like, it's the aristocratic arm of a passive-aggressive behavior. And it always calls forth those demons that will be transformed into prophetesses. She's called the witch of Endor. I can't find God, so I want a witch to inform me what Samuel is saying. 
Y'all not praying with me. It's high time we rid our ears of all that stuff. Unplug from all that stuff. Some of you quote and push and promote people on your uh, social agenda and your social platforms. That is shocking to me. Sharing words of affirmation from a guy who has had three illegitimate kids and is being sued in civil court in Harris County right now for $4 million for past alimony. But he's a prophet. Really? Can we please get holy enough to say that's stupid? Let me try that. That's a special anointing. That's stupid. Anybody that stands up and wants to tell me about the future of the church who's having illegitimate children, having love affairs that are outside of the bonds of his marriage covenant, but he's going to parade around in a $5,000 suit and convince me he's a prophet. Oh, he's a prophet. P-R-O-F-I-T. He's a prophet. A profiteer of illicit love affairs. I don't have time for that kind of crap. I mean, that kind of stuff. I need God to get a hold of me from the fountainhead of revelation and from the place of his own anointing. I want the purity of God to purge me and cleanse me and anoint me so that I can stand up in the face of rulers and say, thus saith the Lord. Can I get a witness? Now, I'm trying to hurry because I haven't gotten there yet. But if you're going to sit here and you're going to understand anything about prophetic anointing, you've got to understand that eschatology comes from a place where you don't have all the answers, but you have questions. God doesn't have to give you answers for you to be informed of the future. He gives you the right questions to ask so that you will seek the right answer. Can I get a witness? So... He tells us, I want you to see the looming dangers and the judgments that are to come that are assigned to earth and they will fall upon the heads of men and they will consume them in their unbridled lust. I want you to learn from them. Now, if I just repeated that to you, you should have enough awareness to say, okay, I'm not going to be a part of that company. I don't need God to give me uh, paragraph one, Roman numeral one, letter A. Do not cavort with those who have unbridled lust. No, I don't need that. I just need to know the demeanor and the position of God's word when he said, I'm going to consume those who walk with an unbridled lust for those things that are against me. That is enough for me to say, I don't want to be in association with that. I'm not going to be in league with that. I'm going to stand over here. Now, where is over here? It's among a group of people that God calls his sentinel army. They are watchmen who are not afraid to speak up, speak out, and cry aloud. I want to be in that company of people that have preachers and men and women of God that are speaking up, speaking out, and crying aloud. Well, it's not popular. It's not fun. It doesn't look normal. It's a little weird. It may be eccentric. It's old-fashioned. It's from another time. Oh, my God. God always uses people that look like they're out of step with time because they march from your future. John the Baptist, everybody in religion was uh, absconding him. They were running from him. He was weird. He couldn't get in the church. He didn't dress right. He had spittle in his beard. He was eating the locust bean. He was uh, dipping his beard in wild honey. He was wild. He was. He had mangy hair. He had uh, garments that were made out of uh, skins of, of of all kinds of flesh, and he was walking around prophesying. But the people were pricked in their hearts, so much so that his head became the valued. Desire of a woman who hated prophecy. Anytime you want to meet somebody that is against the word of your future, look how they react to the word of promise over your life. 
Oh, you just missed that. Anytime you want to find out who is the real enemy of the God of your blessing, watch how they react when God starts talking to them about how blessed you are. Never get distracted by people who hate your blessing. I'm going to preach to myself. All of my life I've been misunderstood. All of my life I've been lied on. All of my life. I came out of the womb and they were lying. At least I think so. You can't get distracted and allow other people's opinions to form and, and build a caricature of what you're going to turn out like. You have to accept that as a challenge and say, watch me live over that. Watch me be greater than that. Watch me refuse to be defined by that. You got to make up in your mind. Well, he was born with a platinum spoon in his mouth. Yes, sir. Praise God. Three of them. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Y'all miss that. Stop, stop trying to have an argument about how poor you are and you weren't born on that, the right side of the tracks and you dug yourself out. Just confirm them in their stupidity. Yes, sir, I sure was. Praise God. Had a whole set. Not one spoon. How dare you say one spoon? I had the whole tray. Because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. And he always wants to talk you out of what God is already doing for your future. He doesn't want you to be saved. So you have to have a voice, a prophetic voice, a voice that will shout with a sound of eschatology that says God is coming back and you're living in this present age and he's called you to it. So if you're going to be a man or a woman of God, you've got to make up in your mind that you're going to carry his burden. You're going to carry the burden of eschatology. You're going to have the worldview, a biblical worldview from the future. I will be saved. I will stand up and declare the goodness of the Lord. I will shout about what he's doing in my life. I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am going to carry the name of the Lord. I will be what he wants me to be. I will do that in the marketplace. I will do that on my job. I will do that in the hospital. I will do that wherever I go. I am the Lord's child and I will be his representative. Are you ready? Are you ready? This is the Lord's business. Lord, you said you blessed it, and no man can corrupt it. I thank you for the blessing of this business. I thank you for bringing wealth through the front door. I thank you that wealth is coming in seven ways, and it's all for your glory and to finance your kingdom. How come you're intimidated and not speaking that loudly? Well, I'm praying it in my mind. No, no, no. You got to get it out of your speech. Speech, that's the power of your speech, to confess it, to profess it. Why? Because a burden must be heard. I said a burden must be heard. If you want to prevail with God, you've got to pray from a burden. And when you pray, you can't be praying in your mind. You're going to be praying loud, uttering groanings that the world will not know how to interpret. And when you pray, you're going to pray with your face in the carpet and you may not get up for hours, but you're praying through something. You're praying to something. You're praying with something. You're praying for the God of all glory to hear your cry and the cry of your people until the kingdom of God moves. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody, somebody say a burden. When I get a hold of the burden of God and I get a hold of the burden that is so overwhelming and, and consuming, it's an all-consuming burden, I cannot, uh, I cannot get up and be frivolous. You can't jump up from a place of a burden and just go out and play blackjack. Isn't that a game? Blackjack, backgammon, something, whatever it's called. You, can, you can't move things around the chessboard. Just... Like, oh, that, that was 30 minutes ago. No, no, no. When you have a burden, you live in it. You're burdened by it. That's what a burden does. A burden drives you. Somebody say, I have a conviction. Now, if you have a conviction and it consumes you and becomes a burden to you, it should not be easily laid down. 
it should stay with you until it becomes a way of life for you. And if you have it as a way of life, then it's going to drive you into the carpet at midnight. It's going to intercede through you during the darkness of your hour. It's going to call for you to intercede against the collapse of culture. It's going to raise you up as a sentinel against the tsunami of alien armies that are marching toward your people. It's going to mechanize your prayer until you become a one-man army of prayer and God can use you to change the course of a nation. You are an Esther Wake up and use your voice. If you perish, you perish. But pray like the end of God depends upon you. Can I get a witness? Somebody say, I'm going to pray. See, this is what disturbs me about the modern church. We will love to sing all night long, but we won't come to a prayer meeting. Modern worship. the trap for many. But you're coming into a place now where worship alone won't satisfy you. And there's nothing wrong with worship. Please understand. I'm not diminishing its value. I'm just simply saying we've gotten captured with the idea of singing about him without interceding to him. And if we ever start interceding, I'm going to tell you what. Just let me clarify this for the people that are watching online. Intercession is ugly. It's mascara ruining ugly. Let me try it one more time. It's a mess up your face ugly. And when you get in that place, you don't care. You don't care if one of your, I saw a girl the other day, her eyelash was coming off. She had one eyelash. It was hanging off. And she was just weeping before God. She didn't care about her eyelash dangling. I wanted to reach up there and take it for her. But, but you, you just got to pull it off and say, God, if I've got one short and one long, I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I look like going through a Chick-fil-A drive through I don't care what they think about me. I don't care if they understand. If I've got black streaks running all over me and I look like I just came from a Kiss backstage concert, I don't care what I look like. I don't care what they think about me. I've been in the presence of God and I'm praying until things change. I don't want Jesus to move on me as long as I look pretty. Because for some of us, we've never had that problem. Sir, say that again. <laughs> You've got to embrace who you are in God and don't worry about the outcome. You just obey him and say, God, you're taking me to a place where I'm going to see things others cannot. I'm going to hear things others do not. I'm going to walk in places others have not. I'm going to see what God has ordained for me. I'm going to have his blessing. Somebody say, I've got to be that person who stands up against an antichrist culture. I said, I'm going to be that person who stands up in the face of an antichrist culture. And I declare that no matter how great you think your league is, it's just one man and God. That's all he needs. One woman and God. And he can preserve a nation. He can change the course of a nation. But it takes a man or a woman of God. Shout I will be that man, that woman. Say it. I will be that man. Esther, what are you doing? I'm going into the king's court. Whether I live or whether I perish is unimportant now. The cause is greater than my life. Let me try it one more time. The cause is greater than Esther's life. And you're living in the same dynamic. And I'm here to tell you this morning that the cause is greater than your life. If the enemy cannot intimidate you with the idea of killing you, then he can never stop you. The greatest weapon in his arsenal is to intimidate you and make you afraid of dying. But if you can look in the face of death and say, I'm unafraid, I won't be moved, what else is he going to say to you? If you do that, 
I'm going to hurt you. Really? Try that. See how that works out. Israel, 300, over 300 ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones that their enemy was certain would destroy them. Seven got through. And they all landed in a place of minimal damage. Didn't even put the runway out of order. You know, <laughs> if you're God's enemy, the first thing you should want to do is calculate your munitions to land in a place where he can't take off his birds that can counter your ballistic missiles with his ballistic missiles. And he didn't even hit the runway. You didn't get that yet. That's the God you serve. That's his awesomeness. That's his power. And he guards over Israel, but he also guards with the same eye over you. You need to broaden your shoulders and look at the devil and say, I'm not afraid. I'm not intimidated. Yes, you might have wreaked hell in my life. Yes, you may have caused trouble. Yes, you might have ter brought turmoil. And may I may have been through some tribulations, but none of that is of any effect to me. I take delight in the law of the Lord. Philippians 3 says, Paul said, I want you to understand something. E even in Romans, he says, I want you to understand something. I am the chief. If anybody's going to merit praise in faith and they're going to praise their flesh, I'm the chief among you. I was born in a Pharisee's house. I'm a zealot. I persecuted the church. I'm all these things in flesh, but I count none of that. None of that matters. Now I'm in pursuit of one thing and it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah of your universe. He is the God of your salvation. That's all I care about. And if you ever get a hold of this thing, you're going to stand up and you're going to broaden your shoulders and you're not intimidated by anybody or their offices. And you stand up and say, I am the one who stands up to speak for Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, Men and women of the jury, hear what thus saith the Lord. Israel's enemies will not prevail. I said Israel's enemies will not prevail. Israel is a type of the church. The church's enemies will not prevail. This old ship of Zion has always sailed. It's been through the fire. It's been through the flood. It's been through persecutions. It's been through death. It's been through martyrdom. Everything you've assailed it with, everything hell has got, he's launched against the church and the church keeps on winning. The church keeps on winning. The church keeps on moving. The church keeps on proclaiming. The church triumphant cannot be destroyed. We need people today we need people in America today who do not have timid beliefs. Now's not the time to be timid. We don't need timid believers and we do not need weak need preachers. Every weak need preacher that hears me this morning should resign tonight. We'd be better off closing churches down than having churches pollute the corruptible minds of men with the idea that we can only preach a soft gospel. We don't need weak need preachers and we don't need feeble fellows with anemic faith. We need people who will stand up and say, I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on. For it is the power of God unto salvation. I do not regret... The truth. Somebody say, I do not regret the truth. I'm not going to live with people who spend their days wallowing in the remorse of lost visitations. What does that mean? That means people who have spent all of their time talking about the goodness of God in 1969. But something happened to the church along the way. It's not the same. 
Those were the good old days. No, this is the best day. Now, we may not sing like you think we ought to sing, and we may not have the air conditioner set like we think you think we ought to have it set, and we may not have the kind of carpet you want to have, but we're believing for it. But we don't have all that stuff yet. But that doesn't mean that God's not moving and this is not his best day. This is the day of the apocalypse. This is the day of the awakening. This is the day of prophetic anointing. This is the day to pray like you've never prayed. This is the day to do away with discouragement. Everybody say, do away with it. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 12 and 10 that the enemy had turned their hearts and that the people began to, leave, to, to live in regret of the truth that they had forsaken. You can, listen, you can't live with a mindset that you are living in regret over the things you haven't done. Put that under the blood and stand up and say, now is time. Now, I may not have done some things yesterday that I should have done, but I'm putting that under the blood. Now I'm going to live like I've never lived before. i got to hurry. We need a new wave of Christo-sentimentalist. You with me? Say that word with me, Christo-sentimentalist. In other words, we need people to get so joyful about the Jesus they know that they don't mind standing up and joyfully, joyfully proclaiming like Julie Ward Howe did. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Boy, that was weak. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You call it the battle hymn of the republic. She sang it as a song of praise. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. What would happen if the church in America would start rising up and saying, we've seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's coming back. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a people that are blood bought. He's coming back for a people that are blood washed. He's coming back for a people that are rejoicing in him. He's coming back for a happy people. That's a new concept. If I had a piano in here, I'd play it right now. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Y'all don't know that? You got to go back to Sunday school. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name. We gets wild right here. Spoke in tongues as the Holy Ghost came. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. And we grew up as kids thinking that it was normal to be Christian and be happy. Now we've got people walking around like this. What's wrong with you? I'm just believing in Jesus. <laughs> really? I just can't believe that I've served him all of my life and he didn't let me win that billion dollar lotto. I could have done so much for him if he would have just let me have the winning ticket. I just believe I'll just keep going on one more day. <laughs> That's not exactly the people he's looking for. Now, he's, he's patient with that. He's going to work with you. But he's looking for somebody that's just rambunctious with joy. How you doing? Man, I'm doing awesome. God's been good to me. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. What was she singing about? She was singing about her point of view for the day she lived in from an eschatological viewpoint. She was looking from the future of prophecy back to the day and age she lived in and said, I believe that America is the place that God will bless. What would we do if we would start saying, I believe the church is the place God dwells. Do you believe it? Here's, a, here's, a, here's a, a different point of view. The desperate church, I said the desperate church, becomes a triumphant church when she embraces her grand narrative. The desperate church becomes the triumphant church when she embraces her grand narrative. Our narrative is never to be formed out of our desperation and our need. Our 
narrative, if you will, the, the soliloquy of our life should be formed out of the promises of God over us. God has promised me good things. Yeah, but you're going through hell right now. That, that is a temporary place. That's something I'm trafficking through. This is just a temporary locale. This is just a valley that I'm trafficking through. But the Lord is with me in my valley. He is the Lord of my valley. I'm the lily of his valley. I'm his bright and morning star. Come on, somebody. You've got to have a God that walks with you through your trouble, but your trouble does not define you. Desperate, desperate. Stop praying for the world to change and for the, for the Lord to equip you for a troubled world. The psalmist, we need the psalmist anointing. Right now, we need the psalmist anointing. Everybody say, I need the psalmist anointing. The psalmist anointing of glad tidings. I need glad tidings to run all over me like hot oil. I don't need to be uh, a part of this tender-tilled last-day generation that doesn't know anything about goodness, doesn't know anything about prosperity, doesn't know anything about favor, doesn't know anything about God being your economy. I, I don't need to be trafficking among people that are all living by their opinion. I need the joy of the Lord to be my strength. I need to have that joy that the, the psalmist talked about when he said, this knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. It's too lofty. I cannot attain it by myself. I've seen something in him. I don't even have the language to describe what I've seen. In. It's too wondrous for me. It's too glorious. God has been good to me. So many of us traffic with people that have songs of sorrow and dirge. Well, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know. I just hope we make it through. My God. We got that big record, that LP, what was it, 76, 78, 86, something. Y'all know that big vinyl thing? Y'all don't know about that. But before they had eight tracks, they had... They had LPs. They were long plays, and you put them on in a needle. And, and, and they had their best praise leader. Their praise and worship leader was Boxcar Willie. Just singing about that, that old house. That old house that the door was falling off of, and the windows were falling off. Y'all don't remember that? That, that old house. And then just, just if I can get through this old house and get a bowl of butter beans. <laughs> just a bowl of butter beans. I'll, I'll be happy. What in the world have we allowed to frame our praise with a song of dirge just because we've stopped seeing from the future? This is the calamity of Psalms 139. And the prophets declared that they were captured in Persia and they, they hung their harps in the willows and they stopped singing the songs of Zion because their complexion changed by the problems that were before them. You better wake up in your spirit and realize right now, I've got to start praising God not for where I am or for what I'm in, but for what he's doing in my life. Somebody shout, I'm going to praise through my present danger. I'm going to hurry. I'm going to hurry real quick. Everybody say Christian eschatology. It's the study of the end times, and it's the ultimate destiny of humanity, and it informs you. And if you didn't hear that message, you can go back and, and get a hold of it. But I want to talk to you this morning for five minutes. I've got to hurry. Way too long. That we have an ever-present help in our time of need, but we only exercise that when we are an ever-present witness of our faith. If we make up in our minds to be an ever-present witness in our faith, that means we're called to embrace the transformative power of the Holy Ghost in our life. We've got to be make sure that we're standing on station 24-7, that we're the guardians of the Spirit of God that works in us, and He works in us by His righteousness, and He's guarding over our life. And everywhere we go, we're concerned about taking Him with us. Did you know that when you walk in such power and in such glory and such authority that there is no measure of hell that can touch you? 
You may even be led into the fire. But when you look up, you will not have a smell of smoke on you. There will be no flame that touch you. And you'll see one walking with you like the Son of God. They may throw you in a lion's den, but when you look up, the lions cannot open their mouth and you will stand guard over them with prayer unceasing and the enemy's king will come at morning time and look down and say, I perceive that God has been in the lion's den with you. Is there anybody in here that wants to stir up your faith? Stir up your faith for a cosmic storm that you've lived through. I just spoke to you last week about it. Anybody here? Have you put two and two together yet? I don't know if you know this or not, but there's an eclipse that happened. And just because you didn't see something happen on your block, you thought nothing mattered. But something happened all over the world and there was unleashed a seal. And atmospheres changed. Atmospheric pressure changed. The climate changed. A day, 24 hours later, you had a kind of storm that no one could even discuss or talk about. You saw winds like hurricane-type winds, tornadic vestibules moved over Harris County, all kinds of things unhurled and unleashed, and we still didn't get it. At the same time around the world, there were people unboxing and uncarding demonic plans to attack the people of God, and we still don't get anything about it. I'm telling you that we're living in a prophetic moment, and until we get our eyes lifted up, and we see from the heel of God himself, and we look from his courtroom, and we look through his throne room, and we see with an eschatological point of view, we're not going to see what he's doing. I want to see it. I want to know what his next move is. Would you like to know? All right. We'll see how bad you want to know it. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Some of you still won't believe it. Israel's going to respond. And their response is going to be absolutely otherworldly. This is no time to play, people. Now, we've scurried all the cabinets of all the rulerships on earth. And all of them have pledged that they would stand, or some of them have pledged that they would stand with Israel. But that pledge is contingent upon Israel's response. But Israel's not going to respond with a Western mentality. This for that. No, 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 no. Israel doesn't respond like that. Last night, they took a plane off that has not left the ground in years. It's called the doomsday plane. The president of Israel, the prime minister, the cabinet of Israel got on that plane and left Israel last night. That plane has not been employed before. On that plane are certain computations and instrumentations that allow them to formulate the Samson option. Anybody here? Say that with me. The Samson option. Everything Israel does has a a Judaic overtone. It has a lineage of of history behind it. That's why one uh, one of the things that was protecting them last night, one of the... Uh, the guardians of Israel's perimeter is called David Sling. That's the armament that was protecting them from the ballistic missiles. David Sling. They took off in an airplane with the Samson option at their fingertips. If they use the kind of force that Israel has historically used in retribution 
against their enemies. And you have to understand why. Because they're not the size of every other country. So they have to make a believer out of the country that attacks them. And when they do that, the entire world is going to step back from supporting them because it's going to be too overwhelming. And Russia, early this morning, Vladimir Putin has already called our president and warned him not to get involved. So Russia has been drawn into the fight whether they want it to be or not, and they've sided with Persia. That is Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. I'm telling you people, it's high time that we get unashamed of being God's people on planet earth. And we start praying, peace over Israel, peace over my family, peace over my home, peace, peace. Pete, if you have a marriage uh, spat, is that a good word? If you have a disagreement in your marriage, if you have something going on, you shouldn't let the sun go down on your wrath. And you ought to forgive everybody in your life. Get your vessel clean and say, Lord, I'm purging my life. I'm not looking back one more day. I don't care what Uncle Joe did against me when I was 12 years old. I don't care. Joe is in your hands. I'm going into the next phase of my life ready as a sentinel who is seeing the coming of the Lord. Are you with me? I know that this doesn't make you shout and run the aisle today. Doesn't make you get hyped up and excited about all of the things that typically motivate us. But this is a warning to you that we're living on the very cusp of the coming of the Lord. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, look up. Look up. Look toward the eastern gate. Our old pastor said, look toward the eastern sky. That's that away. Look up for your redemption draws nigh. And I don't know if that means this afternoon or 30 years from now. But I promise you, you better live every day like Jesus could come back today. And if there's anything, any unforgiveness in your life, today is the day to kill it on an altar of sacrifice. If there's anything that you harbor against someone, this is the day to release that and forgive them. Lord, listen, forgiveness is not letting them off. Forgiveness is setting you free. There's people that have harmed you and done unjust things toward you that have so scarred you that you cannot function for your future. And they've gone on in their life and they don't even think about it. They may not even know it. But all it's done is create a prison for you. And today is the day to set that free and say, I'm, I'm giving that up to God. That's, that's between God and them. I'm going to be free of that, and I'm going to live without condemnation. There's that kind of liberty in this room right now, and that kind of deliverance. And I want to give everybody an opportunity to pray. I'm sorry for going so long this morning. But we've got to get this down in our spirit. Now is the time. It's like, a, it's like a gear shift in an old car. You've got to forcefully and manually make the shift. You cannot live like you were living six months ago. Things are happening too fast. Did you know that if we're on a precipice, I'm just saying now, watch this. I'm just saying, if we're on the precipice of a world war and every prognosticator says we are, then everything in your life will become suspended. And there will be no future elections in wartime. The enemy knows exactly what he has planned. And we've got a God that's whispering in our ear his plans. And so when he comes in one way, we go around him seven different ways. And he says, what happened? I'm going to close with this. You're the holiness of God. The holiness of God, when it, when it marks you, remember last week I talked about the mark in your forehead? When you become the known of God, then you cannot touch the unclean. 
and everything is devoted to him. And he told them in Joshua, he kept telling them, I want you to be of good courage. I want you to be of good courage. Be of good courage. Be equipped with courage. Now, while you're stirring up your courage, the first thing you take, you give to me. It's devoted to my holiness. Don't touch it. Everything about it is mine. It will be consumed in the fires of my dedication. Don't touch it. But one from the tribe of Judah named Achan had to prove he could touch it. You're going to be hearing things from people that are going to try to straddle the fence. And they're going to tell you that you can live for God without the kind of commitment you're being ushered into. You can stay at ease in Zion. No, no, no. You got to go all in. You got to go all in. And you got to separate yourself from their voices. I'm not, I don't have ears to hear that. I'm all in. Jesus is mine and I am his. So if you're here this morning and you want to stand with me to your feet, if you're online, I want to pray for you right now. Right where you are. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for your glory and your power. And I thank you for your authority and I thank you for touching our friends wherever they are, wherever they reside, wherever they're watching from. I thank you for anointing their life and putting a call upon them. You've emblazoned your name upon their forehead and you've numbered them in the scroll of your book of life. And I pray a covering about them and a blood covering over them. In Jesus' name, fill them with the power of the Holy Spirit of God and we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And for all of you that are here right now, if you're ready to step into that bold faith, that faith that says, I can proclaim the goodness of the Lord. I can pray His will. I can see things happen. I can walk in apostolic power. That means I'm going to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. If you're ready for that kind of anointing, I want you to come down to the floor with me right now. We're going to pray for you. 